Thanks, Seb, for that wonderful presentation. And, and now uh, we have the pleasure to welcome Ethan Zuckerman. He's also relatively new in the lab, so a warm welcome would be very, very nice. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, Cesar's programming genius in putting this, uh, this show together is going to become immediately apparent to you as, as you try to figure out how you get from sort of the beautiful artwork that Sep is doing uh, over to uh, Wada Kanfar talking about the Arab Spring and uh, change around the world. And, and, and what I would suggest to sort of get you one step there is to think in those visualizations of I'm feeling revolutionary or I'm feeling like overthrowing a government. Uh, because part of what I want to talk about is what happens when people do decide that they want to overthrow a government. Uh, it's 2011. This is a year that I think, depending on how this year ends up, is going to be remembered perhaps as we remember 1989, uh, 1968, possibly 1848, as one of these years where the world as we know it changes fairly radically. And at this point, there's at least two sets of open questions about events of the Arab Spring, also events like the London riots, also events like Occupy. The first set of questions is basically, are these changes, are these physical protests, people coming out into physical space going to have real and lasting change on how people govern and organize themselves? And then there's at least one other set of unanswered questions, which is, are these changes that we're seeing somehow related to changes that we have going on in media, in the internet, in our ability to produce and share information in one fashion or another? And again, I introduce these as unanswered questions because I think, in general, anyone who tells you that they've got a good answer to them probably doesn't know what they're talking about. But they are questions that everybody is wrestling with. And we're wrestling with them both from a point of excitement with the possibility of transformation in a place like Tahrir and also from a place of fear in a situation, for instance, like the London riots, which if I could advance slides, we would be able to look at, where not only is there a tremendous amount of fear about what happens when disenfranchised youth are taken to the streets, but also additional fear that somehow perhaps technology, the, the, the magical mystery tool that is the BlackBerry, is enabling some sort of social organization and some sort of rioting uh, that uh, might actually cause us to shut down communication networks to lead towards social stability. I'd also like to dispel the rumor that, in fact, the BlackBerry shutdown yesterday had anything to do with the shortage of orange t-shirts here. I realized that was going around the crowd. I, I just want to put it out of our heads. But as we try to understand this question of how media and real world social change are related, I really think we want to go and sort of start with patient zero. And for me, patient zero in all of this is Tunisia. Uh, and the reason that we need to think about Tunisia is that Tunisia ended up being the inspiration for what ends up happening in Egypt. It's the inspiration for Libya, it's the inspiration for Yemen, as everybody else throughout the world is thinking about this possibility that they might be able to change a system of government that they've been living in for years. Tunisia is what everyone is looking back to, and the idea that in really less than a month, the people of Tunisia were able to oust a dictator who had been in power for more than 20 years. What's interesting about Tunisia, which got much, much less attention in the US than Egypt, than Libya, than a lot of these other revolutions, is that it's actually sort of a mystery what's actually happened to make this possible. And the reason I say that it's a mystery is that there have been no shortage of potential revolutions in Tunisia. In fact, people have been trying to overthrow Ben Ali's government in Tunisia for many, many, many years. And we can just go back a couple of years to a protest that happened in Gafsa. Gafsa is a city of about 80,000 people. It's a mining village. It's the ninth largest city in Tunisia. It's not a place you would ever go for any particular reason unless you're involved with mining. And what happened in this village is that people took the mining exam. And the mining exam is critical, because if you don't get a job in the mines, you're not going to get a job in Gafsa. And if you didn't pay somebody off, you didn't get a good score on the mining exam. And so because there was corruption around the mining exam, you had young men taking into the streets and protesting against the unfairness of this system. And the Tunisian government did what the Tunisian government has always done. They sent in riot police. They fired bullets at people. They scared people back into their houses. And they also put a media cordon around the city. You couldn't get in and out of Gafsa. There was no way to get information in and out of Gafsa. The press, which is almost entirely government controlled, couldn't get into the city and couldn't report. And networks like Al Jazeera, which has never been allowed to have a news bureau within Tunisia, were not able to get in. 
If you knew about what was going on in Gafsa, you knew about it because you were getting email from a couple of people on the ground there, but no one else in Tunisia knew what was happening in that case. The protests lasted for about 10 days. People got sick of being shot at. They went back to their homes, and the Ben Ali regime was stable. Two years later, literally two years later, just up the road, an even smaller town of Sidi Bouzid, now a city of 30,000 people, you have a young man, Mohamed Bouazizi, lights himself on fire to protest the fact that his vegetable cart has been confiscated. His family takes to the streets and starts protesting on the front steps of the city hall in Sidi Bouzid. But something very, very different happens this time. And we think what happens that's different is that his family pick up mobile phones, they make videos of the protest, they post those videos on Facebook. And depending on how you've heard this story, usually what happens there is someone says, and then it goes viral. And in general, when someone says, and then it goes viral, it means we have no idea what happens next. <laughs> but we, in fact, do know what happens next here in the context of Tunisia. And this is what happens next. You pick up the mobile phone. You're putting these videos out on Facebook. And, and let's play for a moment with why Facebook is important. Facebook is not, in fact, my default preferred platform for throwing a revolution. Uh, but it happens to be the only platform that was accessible in Tunisia to the average Tunisian. Every other site that allowed people to share video had been blocked or shut down. And the reason, the only reason that Facebook had not been shut down is during those gaffes of protest two years earlier, the Tunisian government had tried to block Facebook. And in fact, Tunisians had flocked to proxy servers. They'd found ways to get around the censorship. And in fact, the number of Tunisians using Facebook increased by a factor of 10 during that 10-day protest. So the Tunisian government knew that they couldn't shut down Facebook. They knew that people were going to share video on Facebook, so they did something very, very sinister. They started phishing for people's passwords. If you logged into Facebook at some point in 2010, there was a very good chance that you were not logging onto Facebook. You were logging onto a Tunisian government page. And it took your username and password, which, by the way, Facebook was doing login and clear text, took your information. And the Tunisian government would then go download your friend's network and know who you were paying attention to. So if you were sane in Tunisia, you were not looking at these videos coming from Sidi Bouzid. You knew that the government was watching what you were doing. You knew they had full surveillance in the network. There was no freaking way you were going to take the risk of becoming friends of Sidi Bouzid and essentially announcing yourselves as enemies of the Ben Ali government. But that doesn't stop this group, Nawat. Nawat is a group of Tunisian dissidents. These guys have been out of the country for 10 years. They've been trying to be the digital thorn in Ben Ali's side. They make humorous videos making fun of the man. They made a wonderful video of his wife's shopping trips, which they documented by watching the Tunisian presidential jet show up on airline spotters' websites. And they're able to document how she's flying around Europe uh, to, to buy shoes. So these guys have no compunctions about going onto Facebook, collecting all this information. They translate it from Tunisian Arabic. They translate it into English and French and classical Arabic. They package it all together. And they say, hey, World Wide Web, if anyone wants to know what's happening in Tunisia, help yourselves. Who helps themselves? Al Jazeera helps themselves. Now, Jazeera, you'll remember, is not allowed to operate in Tunisia. Ben Ali has never allowed them to run a newsroom there. And if you know anything about Al Jazeera, you know that they get really chippy about things like this. So they really, really, really want to report on what's going on in Tunisia. And so they take this material that's coming from Nawat, they broadcast it over Jazeera, which, while it cannot report from Tunisia, is watched everywhere in Tunisia. What happens? People all throughout this country, for the first time, are able to see a protest happening in the city of 30,000 people. They're able to see that the people who are going out into the streets and protesting are not being mowed down. They're not being arrested. They're actually going out into the streets, and they're able to do this, which is completely unprecedented. And what we start seeing over time is the willingness of people all around the country to take to the streets and try to do things differently. So you've probably seen this photo on the left, which has been, become quite famous, uh, basically in Tahrir Square, thanking Facebook for their role in the Egyptian revolution. You may not have seen the one on the right, 
clearly made by the same author, taken by the same photographer, next to each other on the Flickr set, which is thanking Al Jazeera. But there's no way to understand what actually happens in Tunisia as far as the motivating power of media unless you're understanding both of them. So there's a couple of stories I want to take out of this. The first one is that in an age where it's incredibly easy for us to create media, where people in the front row here have inexpensive digital cameras, can take a photo, can quickly upload it, we've all become media producers. And people are now figuring out that producing media can be a form of political power. And particularly if you feel like you are detached from other forms of political power, media production may be the easiest form of political power that you have access to. And the second point that I want to make is that if you want to understand how media and social change work together, you have to think about media as a complicated ecosystem. You cannot look at single systems like a Twitter, like a Facebook, because the really interesting stuff starts happening at the junctions between those networks. Now, this gets really tough. Those of us who enjoy visualizing networks, which I think basically constitutes almost everybody in this room, and particularly given the amazing speakers we've had on networking the last couple of days, I think we're all excited to sit down and try to figure out the scale-free networks in our lives. And in fact, gorgeous work is being done on this. This is an absolutely beautiful and very helpful visualization of who was tweeting about the Egyptian revolution. The folks in, in red are tweeting in Arabic. The folks in blue are tweeting in English. In purple, you have people who are bilingual between the two. What I find really interesting about this is you can start identifying folks who are bridges between those languages, two language spheres that rarely talk to one another. But you can actually start seeing figures in between who are sort of brokering the relationships between the two. Here's a visualization by my, my colleague John Kelly. John studies blogospheres, and he studies essentially who people link to. And he was able to give us a glimpse in 2008, prior to the revolutions in Iran, what the Iranian blogosphere looks like. And he was able to tell us stuff that we really never would have guessed. We knew that there was this secular expatriate cluster that talked about reformist politics. People who actually read Persian knew that there were people who were on the conservative side who were rooting for Ahmadinejad. But what none of us had realized was that actually Persian poetry was far more important as far as what people were spending time on and writing about until someone had actually come and done this analysis. So these things are really powerful, and they can be really revelatory, but they're only giving you part of the picture. If we really want to understand how people are making media and how people are moving towards change, we need to think about an ecosystem that is at least this complicated, and possibly much, much more complicated than this. And when you look at something this complicated, I think the only thing you can do is figure out how you start small and how you sort of build your way up. So what I think of myself as sort of doing at this point is I'm starting on the left side of the graph and I'm trying to slowly move towards the right. It's really, really hard to try to get a sense for where media influence is in through face to face. Unless you're tracking me, it's very hard to sit in on the conversation that Boris Anthony and I have last night and how that might affect me in all of this. But looking at what sort of information I might be getting via blogs, via newspapers, how ideas spread between those systems, that's something that it's possible to do. The key is that we have to move away from thinking of networks as nodes that are linked together. We need to start thinking about much more basic technologies like words. So we've got a project that I've been working on first at Harvard and now over here at the Media Lab called Media Cloud. And Media Cloud does something very, very simple. It subscribes to about 100,000 media sources. It reads a whole lot of blogs. It reads pretty much any newspaper in America that you can think of. And it reads every story. And it grabs all of them. It grabs the entirety of the text. It throws it in a database. And it says, maybe you'll want this at some point in the future. And it's doing it in an open data fashion so that other researchers who want to start studying the emergence of words or terms, something like, where does Occupy Wall Street start, can go back and run the tape back and figure out when we see new ideas sort of insert themselves into the debate. And it's dated, and it's sorted, and it's possible to go through it with all sorts of text analysis techniques. It's also possible to put some very simple interfaces on top of it. So here's just a very simple visualization of everything within the top 25 newspapers in the United States talking about Occupy or occupation over a period of two weeks, uh, the week that started at the end of September and then the week that starts in October. And we watch 
dialogue about Occupy shift from being about Jerusalem and Palestinians and essentially Palestinian statehood at the UN into a debate actually about Occupy Wall Street. We essentially watch the Occupy term turn from what we normally think of it as being to turning into this new political movement that's coming into play. We get something very interesting and very different when we start looking at how bloggers on the left and bloggers on the right are looking at Occupy. The left is talking about corporations. They're talking about all the different places this is happening, like Buffalo, like Boston, like Los Angeles. On the right, you'll see that uh, we're talking about anarchists, communists, uh, hippies, uh, and George Soros. Uh, and so you quickly end up with the sort of divisive language that comes into play as you're trying to think about what's going on within the space. My goal behind this, where I'm going with this, is I want to get to the point where we can put labels on information. I want to be able to take a newspaper, to take a blog, and to say, here's what's being covered, and here's what's not being covered. And my reason for this is not so that I could shake my finger at someone like the New York Times and say, do better, give us more coverage of the Arab world. My goal, and, and by the way, if you're interested in how the New York Times is doing on this, we have a visualization down on the third floor of how they're doing international news over time. My goal eventually is to get to the point where we can think about things like the quantified self movement, a movement of people who are tracking how much they're walking or how much they're eating, how they're interacting with the physical world, and bring those ideas into the media space. What are we learning about? What are we thinking about? And what are we as individuals amplifying? What am I taking in from that complex world of media, and how am I deciding to amplify it and send it out into my networks? Why does this matter? It matters because it's very, very easy for us to miss what's happening in the news. The story around Tunisia was completely invisible in American media. We started reporting about it on the Global Voices Project on December 20th. Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire on December 17th. The first time Bouazizi's name appears in the New York Times is January 14, which is the day that Ben Ali steps down. For 24 days, you had a country rising up and revolting, and it doesn't show up in this country's best newspaper. And by the way, it's not just the press. If you talk to people in the American intelligence community, they'll tell you they missed it as well. My question is, if we can start to understand these ecosystems, if we can start to understand the networks that represent media, can we figure out how to watch the next revolution? And can we also figure out how to build better tools for people who want to use media to assert change? Thanks. Uh